Well, thank you everyone for joining today. Lovely to have everyone here for the Society for Digital Mental Health. Um, this is the poster session for track two on children, adolescent, and young adults, or track A. Um, do we mind having our first presenter? I believe it's Gamify Digital Mental Health Interventions Demonstrate Efficacy for Treating Pediatric ADHD and Depression. Yeah. So let me share my screen. Okay, so my name is Barry Bryant. I am a third year psychiatry resident at Johns Hopkins. Um, the work that I'm presenting on today is um, called Gamify Digital Mental Health Interventions um, Demonstrate Efficacy for Treating Pediatric ADHD and Depression. This work is the product of a systematic review and meta-analysis where we looked at all of the randomized controlled trials that look at the efficacy, so the effectiveness of video games made to intentionally treat a pediatric mental health condition. And the ones that we looked at were ADHD, depression, and anxiety. We found 27 total randomized controlled trials, and some of those looked at both depression and anxiety. So we ended up with a total of 32, 32 kind of comparisons. And what we found was that uh, when we pooled the data with a meta-analysis, they showed moderate efficacy for ADHD and depression, and they showed non-significant effectiveness for treating anxiety. Um, we also looked at moderators that you know, tried to help explain what were maybe some of the factors that went into whether or not they were effective. And so for the uh, ADHD-focused games, we found that they were more effective for males as opposed to females. And we also uh, found that they were more effective when they were delivered on a computer as opposed to like a tablet or a smartphone. Uh, for depression, we found that ones with time limits were more effective as well. So, you know, versus just playing as little or as much as you want, you know, if they had a hard stop at like an hour, uh, those were more effective too. Our hypothesis for why that might have been the case was, you know, between the time limits as well as the computer, that might have been indicative of a more controlled environment. So like on a computer with a time limit, possibly a, like a test center, uh, as opposed to kind of hanging out in the back seat of a minivan or uh, on the couch at home with no clear um, kind of structured environment. So again, to summarize, uh, looking at all the video games that were made specifically to treat these conditions, they were overall effective for ADHD and depression not so much for anxiety, and there were a couple of different moderators, especially ones related to context that made them more effective. Happy to answer any questions. Do we have any questions, Dr. Frank? Feel free to come off mute or use the Q&A feature in the chat. Uh, Claire asks, what were the contents of the games? That's a great question. So for the ADHD ones, they were mostly either things like racing games or games that involve split attention. So you might be migrating around a maze looking for specific fruits or something. And so you might have something in the corner of the screen that tells you what to pick up. And then, you know, as you're going around, you've got to pick up that thing and not pick up the other thing. So kind of attentional based things for the most part there. For depression and anxiety, there were more kind of therapeutic elements or um, things related to things like CBT, some kind of emotional training, um, those sorts of things, like recognizing this is a happy face, sad face, surprised face. Uh, a lot of heterogeneity across games, but those are some of the elements that I saw. No, no, this is Claire. I'm just going to talk instead of type because that's a little more social. Um, if no one else has any other questions, I have. I could keep asking because I'm really curious about this, Barry. Yeah, absolutely. This is, like, how how does this? First of all, full disclosure, I am. I have no training. I'm a 
I work at, uh, with Bethany Teachman. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but how does it, like, what do you think works? Like how soon after playing the game is like mental health impact measured? It does like repeating the game frequently show more enduring effects? Is it like a momentary assessment? Like I, I'm very curious to know. Yeah, how... really, really good questions. Most of the studies that we looked at were on the kind of scale of about four to seven or eight weeks uh, with pretty limited long-term follow-up. I think only one study that we saw published like a six month follow-up study. So you're kind of seeing those changes within that four to eight week time frame. Uh, most studies set it up where they were supposed to play it somewhere between like one and three times a week for about half an hour to an hour at a time. And so over the course of that dose, if you will, that's where they saw the effects. Um, but like you're noting, uh, longer term, hard to know how long those effects would last. Like if you've got to keep going with it long term or if some of those effects stick. And then also, you know, curious about the safety profile things if you were to keep using it, which you know, screen time is a big thing now. If you increase that screen time over the long term, would that have any negative consequences? But really good questions about dosing. And we have some recommendations for kind of collecting more data related to that um, when people do studies like this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, I think we have one time for just one more quick question from Jillian. If Barry, you want to take a stab at that and towards the second presenter, if you can please get ready. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so uh, are there any areas you would encourage mental health game developers to pursue based on your findings? Um, yeah, I think that, I would say that accessibility is a big thing. So um, it's kind of, yeah, you know, everything I talked about, I think that the more engaging games are often good because they, you know, help keep kids interested. But I think that just working with like mental health game developers, like between academia and industry is also really important because um, a lot of the games that we were looking at were no longer accessible. So they would like do a trial and then we wouldn't be able to access it. So theoretically, if you had some academic industry partnerships, the games might be able to stick around longer, which could be, could be a positive as well but more engaging, fun games. I think the racing ones were cool. And there's um, one related to that, which is the only real FDA cleared one as a treatment for anxiety. So yeah, those are, those are my thoughts. Thank you all for listening. Really appreciate the questions. Thanks so much, Mary. Can we have our second speaker? Um, this is using NASSS CAT, CAT tool. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Perfect, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna quickly present this. So my name is Sakshi and I'm uh, conducting this study as a part of my dissertation project at the University of Oxford. I'm currently an MSc student in translational health sciences. And this study looks to uh, evaluate the implementation of a chat story intervention in Brazil. So a bit about Brazilian mental health context. So Brazil faces significant challenges in adolescent mental health, uh, it being the fifth most depressed country globally, according to WHO. And during the pandemic, about one third of Brazilian youth um, exhibited symptoms of depression and anxiety. To address this issue, a uh, chat story intervention uh, was developed by a team of uh, researchers, young people, narrative designers, and technology experts. Um, I want to mention here, it was co-designed uh, with the team itself, and this intervention aims to enhance the adolescent skills in promoting their peers' mental health through direct support and collective action. So the tool was implemented in select schools, um, but uh, it encountered several ch challenges during its initial adoption, particularly in school settings. So this study uses the NAS framework, which I've mentioned. Um, it's a non-adoption abandonment scale up and spread and sustainability framework, which evaluates and addresses complexities in implementing this tool in schools. So it consists of six domains, um, the condition, technology, value proposition, adopter system, organization, and the wider system. 
and the project's secondary objective was to understand the socio-technical changes which resulted from the tool's implementation to develop a recommendation to manage these complexities as well. The data was collected through structured online interviews with the team who developed the tool, which were based in UK and Brazil to support the analysis. Um, you can see the initial set of interviews, we have mapped out some complexities onto um, which were the areas that faced complexity. Uh, so these were uh, technology uh, and internet usage within schools and uh, the wider system itself because of the political climate, which didn't recognize uh, young people's rights. So I can talk more about that in the questions itself, but these, find, uh, these findings mainly highlight the importance of adapting digital health interventions into real world settings and managing the dynamic interactions between technology, the users and the broader systemic factors. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if no one has any questions, again, feel free to use the chat or uh, come off mute. Um, one question I have is, what would be, I guess, the most interesting or um, something you didn't expect while working on this project and hearing from actual users? So, yeah, I think uh, one of the interesting aspects uh, that the young students mentioned were uh, that they felt this this tool was taking a lot of time, uh, so they were losing interest. Uh, so it was supposed to take an hour and a half, uh, but it actually took longer because the students, they actually had to go to the computer rooms itself and the internet outage went out and uh, they actually get, got the 3G routers as well, but the internet crashed because a lot of people started using social media. So these were the wider factors that uh, like, difficulties that were encountered by the young students. And also one interesting aspect was the teachers who were um, implementing this tool in the schools, they were not properly trained. They were given a training resource, but again, it was very difficult for them to understand uh, what this tool actually meant to do. So I think the next step, uh, what we're following with the tool is that we're giving more resources to the teachers and then uh, enhancing their digital literacy as well so they can manage these complexities within school settings. Yeah. We have a question. Were the students intended to use the tool one time at school or ongoing? So yeah, so this was a one-off intervention and it was meant to uh, generate these discussions around mental health and promote any policy changes within the school itself. Um, and the funding again was uh, just for one off intervention, but then the tool was also um, implemented via a social media campaign. But again, uh, due to funding and limitations, the school, uh, the social media campaign is not active at the moment. So um, this is just a one off intervention, yeah. If no more questions, again, feel free to use the chat. Um, can we have our next speaker addressing mental health disparities in urban primary care settings, teen screening practices, and linguistic inclusivity? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gabriela Boadija. Um, I'm a research associate at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Um, I was really curious as to looking into linguistic diversity and pediatric mental health screening tools um, and noticed that a lot of um, standardized metric, psychometric tools lack translated versions. Um, and if a kiddo goes to a primary care visit and a physician administered screening is taken place, it really depends on the provider's proficiency in languages other than English and or the availability of an interpreter. But I noticed that even if both are available, a non-standardized reinterpretation of the scale items may affect scoring and compromise reliability of the psychometric tools. So we disseminated a 
um, survey to Chicago-based healthcare providers serving adolescents in medical clinics. And uh, from the responses, um, language diversity was evident in Chicago-based clinics um, serving teens. Spanish was the second most common language spoken in the clinics by patients and was the highest reported language used for interpretive services. So 85% of the um, providers that indicated um, the use of an interpreter line, 82.6% of them um, were using it for Spanish. And so switching gears and talking more about the digital aspect of this project, um, we noticed from the data that we collected that um, digital screening tools were far less commonly used than the self-reporting physician administration, um, which I thought was interesting because common assessments like the PHQ-9, GAD-7, and Vanderbilt are already available online in multiple languages. Um, and even though that they are available in different languages and it's a one-to-one -one translation um, into that language, um, cultural and linguistic equivalence among diverse populations may not be guaranteed. But that's why I wanted to bring in um, some work that Pfizer is actually doing. Um, online, they have available the PHQ and not only different languages, but in also different dialects. So in this example, I know it's a little small, but um, there is options for Spanish um, in Argentina, Spanish in Puerto Rico, Spanish in Colombia, Mexico. Um, there's different dialects of the Spanish. And as a native speaker, um, I dove into this, um, this uh, tool that's available. And there are some, there are cultural differences in the way that some of the questions are worded, which I thought would, was really interesting um, and could be very beneficial for a diverse population. Um, and so digital administration can really ac um, increase access to multilingual versions of teen assessment measures. And overall, I really wanna emphasize that just effective intercultural communication really needs more than just literal and technical translations. Um, it requires attention to cultural differences. And so by integrating digital screening practices and culturally adapted and appropriate psychometric tools, we can enhance the accessibility and utilization of inclusive mental health screening tools. I'm not going to answer any questions that you guys may have. ask a question if um, there's are still thinking. Um, what are your next steps for this type of project? I see you have under recommendations for future research um, to examine this ideal digital administration options. And so are there any steps that you and your research team will be taking next? Um, not at the moment, uh, but these are some, uh, as they said, recommendations for um, how we can best implement this into primary care um, and taking into consideration how this may affect like workflow and, and all those such factors um, that will make it easier both on the provider and then provide um, more in linguistically inclusive screening tools for teens. I have a question. What are some of the challenges that you anticipate in implementing linguistic inclusivity in different settings? Yeah, um, I think having the availability of culturally different um, linguistic um, assessment tools. Um, as I said, going back into the, the Pfizer resource, when I was looking at some of the uh, different dialects of Spanish, um, there are some that if uh, a provider let's say I had administered this to myself, I would have been like, what does this word mean here? Or I would have been just a little confused as to the wording of each question. So I think just taking into account just different dialects of different languages. Um, so kind of collecting all of, all of those, um, the screening tools will probably be the most challenging part. Thanks.
Any other questions? If not, thanks so much, Gabriella. I have Thank our next, yes, of course. Have our next um, speaker uh, on clinical outcomes across age groups in an intentionally remote partial hospitalization slash intensive outpatient eating disorder treatment program. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Shepard. I'm the clinical research director at Within Health um, and myself and my assistant. Uh, sorry about that. Let's see. Sorry about that. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, so myself and my clinical research assistant, Hannah Wolf, are both employees at Within and our co-author, uh, Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt is the CEO, co-founder and co-owner. So the study that we did that we're sharing about today uh, shows that Within's intentionally remote combined PHP IOP eating disorder treatment yields significant improvements in eating disorder, quality of life, mental health, and weight restoration outcomes across the lifespan. So specifically what we did was we conducted a retrospective chart review of changes from admission to discharge for 115 of our patients who had attended treatment for at least 30 days um, including fairly equivalent representation across adolescent, young adult, and mature adult age groups. Um, notably, patients in this sample were primarily white cisgender women, um, mostly with anorexia or nervosa diagnoses, along with at least one comorbid psychiatric condition. So for our analyses, mixed ANOVAs revealed significant improvements across all outcomes, all with large effects um, and no interaction by age. So suggesting comparable effectiveness across the lifespan. Um, average eating disorder and depressive symptoms, as well as quality of life impairment decreased by between 40 to 45%. And we're all below clinical cutoffs or norm values um, at discharge uh, with trade anxiety showing a more modest decrease, not surprising to us and remaining above the cutoff value. For our patients with anorexia nervosa who admitted at or below 95% of their ideal body weight, indicating they may require weight restoration, uh, weight status also increased significantly with large effects and no interaction by age, and average scores fell into the normal weight range at discharge. So to sum up, um, overall, the study extends prior uh, research by showing that remote combined PHP IOP treatment for eating disorders is effective and yields similar improvements across all ages, um, as well as comparable outcomes to in-person programs, um, including for weight restoration, for which prior research had been particularly uh, mixed on those results. And happy to take any questions. We have a question from Jillian. What was the primary treatment style you use, FPT, CBT-E, um, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so our treatment approach is uh, multidisciplinary and um, eclectic. Uh, so we use an evidence-based practice approach. So we really focus on personalizing and tailoring treatment to each individual and their uh, needs, their diagnosis, et cetera. Um, so we incorporate many of the, the, the treatments that you might expect to see for eating disorders. So um, some of the, the younger folks may get FBT-informed treatment. Um, uh, the core foundation of the program is cognitive behavioral. So we do have CBT, um, acceptance and commitment therapy, DBT groups that um, everyone uh, attends some uh, part of those kinds of groups as well. We have another question in the chat. Can you define the terms PHP plus IOP plus? Yep, great question. There's a tiny note, so you can barely see it on here. Um, so we refer to our program as PHP Plus and IOP Plus um, because it is a re remote program and we do have our own uh, a smartphone application that we use, uh, which allows us to provide support outside of typical programming hours as well. So there's a living room feature, there's a support button, um, chat features, things like that. So folks are getting kind of additional programming or additional support beyond the hours they're actually in the program.
Yep. So the treatment includes individual therapy, group therapy. There's often often family um, or couples therapy. Um, includes digital tools. Um, folks all all meet with a dietitian as well. So there's a dietary component to that. Um, they meet with a care partner. So they have kind of an additional recovery coach that they do work with as well. Um, so there's many parts to the treatment, and that's one of our hopes in the future um, as we continue to see more patients and accrue a larger data set is to be able to dig into the treatment and identify predictors of positive outcomes, identify treatment mechanisms, and really be able to uh, determine which aspects of the treatment are most effective and most influential. Lovely. Um, we have time for one more quick question if anyone has one. Um, could I ask uh, a quick question on, I guess, in terms of who you're working with on this team, um, it's within the context of a hospital system. Are you also working with any um, like therapists or counselors in that setting and other psychologists or um, yeah, who is part of the research here? Who's part of the, the research program specifically? Yeah. yeah, so so um, we have a very a small research team, um, myself um, being a clinical psychologist and my research assistant. Um, and then we also work very closely with our clinical team, which includes psychiatrists, um, dietitians with PhDs as well, um, professional counselors, social workers, et cetera. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, another round of applause. Thank you very much. Can we have our next speaker on evaluating social context and social support among adolescents at risk for suicide in ecological momentary assessment and passive smartphone sensing study? Thank you so much. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. So hi, my name is Jennifer. I recently graduated from Barnard and I'm excited to present some work on evaluating social context and social support among adolescents at risk for suicide. So while social support may protect against suicidal thoughts and behaviors, it's unclear when and with whom adolescents feel most supported. So we were interested in examining social support and its associations with time spent at home and who that time is spent with among a cohort of adolescents, most of whom have a history of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We use smartphone-based ecological momentary assessment, which frequently administers surveys to adolescent smartphones to repeatedly assess how supported adolescents were feeling right now and who they spent the most time with within the past two hours. We also looked at how much time adolescents were spending at home using smartphone-based GPS. And what we found was that adolescents felt less supported when spending time alone compared to with others at home. And while adolescents with a history of suicidal thoughts and behaviors felt considerably less supported compared to psychiatric controls, um, both groups had similar patterns and associations between social context at home and social support, as you can see based on how parallel these lines are. Adolescents also felt more supported when spending time away from home compared to at home, and this was partially supported by the fact that when at home, adolescents were more likely to spend time alone and less likely to spend time with peers. However, this association, again, did not um, differ depending on whether or not adolescents had a history of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. So together, these findings highlight the importance of increasing high-risk adolescent social support and community engagement. And in leveraging these smartphone-based research methods, we're able to study these potential mechanisms for social support in real time, so as to ultimately inform just-in-time interventions for suicide prevention. Thank you so much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. How did you recruit people for this study? Yeah, so participants were recruited um, from, we used a variety of different methods. Um, some were recruited through social media, some were recruited through hospitals and yeah, through flyers and also inpatient facility. Thank you for the question. One question I had, if you can speak to this, um, I'm not sure if this was information you collected, um, but I'm kind of curious if uh, you and the research team looked at the data, um, collected any demographic information, like um, specifically adolescents, or are they from like urban, rural, or uh, metropolitan areas, race, gender, et cetera? Yeah, so I forgot to mention, but um, our data was collected 
at two locations in um, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and New York City. So yeah, a lot of urban metropolitan areas. Um, I do think the sample was mostly white and female. Um, so we are hopeful, we are hoping to um, recruit more diversely in the future. If no one has any follow up questions. Oh, very good. Uh, we have what questions were asked on the EMA? Yeah, so there were a variety of questions asked on EMA. I specifically looked at um, social support and social context, but um, EMA was um, mostly used to prompt various affective states. So from like how happy you're feeling, angry, sad, you know, stressed, um, loneliness, I think inclusion, there were like a couple, maybe eight different ones, yeah. Um, maybe one more question from the crowd. If, we have any? Um, if not, uh, I just wanted to clarify one thing and if you could expand upon this or have thoughts on it um, mm -hmm. regarding like was data collection during the pandemic, for example, when a lot of people were at home, is there anything um, that you may have learned from the study that would, you know, uh, inform your thoughts or perspectives on things like stay-at-home protocols and like how to take care of the mental well-being of adolescents during times like that? Yeah, this is a great question. So we did have some data that was collected during the pandemic. Um, I think data for this analysis was collected between 2019 and 2023. So we did try to control for COVID school closures in our data analyses, but I think inevitably, um, especially when we're looking at time spent at home, um, yeah, the pandemic inevitably affects, probably af like affected how people, um, I think that was definitely like a confounding variable that even it, when we controlled for um, the analysis, I still feel like that inevitably impacted how people um, feel supported or who they're spending time with at home. So yeah, definitely something that I wish I could have looked into. Um, for example, like looking at the data set separately, um, maybe before pandemic, during pandemic and after pandemic, but yeah, maybe something that I will pursue in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another round of applause. Um, and then we have our final poster the session, Increasing Pediatrics Cl Clinicians Provision of Digital Self-Care Tool to Adolescents Ages 13 to 17 with Mild to Moderate Depressive Symptoms at a Large Integrated Healthcare System. Let's see, can you, can you, can everyone see my uh, poster now? Yes. Good. Okay, fabulous. Um, so my name is Davida Becker, and I am a researcher and an educator based at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. So the poster I'm presenting is from a uh, quality improvement project that we conducted um, on the tales of the pandemic, realizing adolescents have a lot of unmet mental health needs. There's a lot of barriers to treatment. And we have digital uh, self-care tools already within our healthcare system, but at the time they weren't readily being uh, used with adolescents. So we wanted to test out an implementation project with our um, pediatrics clinicians to see if they could start offering a digital um, tool, one specific digital tool, it was Wobot for adolescents that we actually used in this project. Um, and their, the ask of them was that they would implement um, depression screening and then based on the results of the, the screening, any adolescents that were in the mild to moderate range of depression, they would offer an app um, at the visit um, in addition to whatever um, other services they would be providing or referrals. Um, and so our... Um, the measures we wanted to collect were, you know, what happened when this happened? Did they make these referrals? Did the adolescents accept the referrals? And then overall, what were their 
kind of perspectives on using this tool in their workflow. And in our system, there is there are already digital tools available. We have a broader ecosystem, um, and Wobot is one of the tools, um, but there's also pathways that have been developed for providers to make uh, referrals. So we worked with, um, we recruited 48 pediatrics clinicians um, from all, all across Southern California. We had four medical service areas with diverse sociodemographic characteristics. Um, and we did virtual training sessions with our clinicians. We actually created informational materials for them to display in exam rooms. We um, also did audit and feedback reports. So they understood their levels of patients they were seeing and their referrals. Um, and then we also in, embedded in our training, asked the physicians to try out the tool themselves so they could make a, an informed referral. Um, so during the study period, um, actually another point is that the clinicians were all primary care and family medicine and pediatrics. Um, and their ranges of the numbers of adolescents they saw really varied widely. Some of them were more adolescent specific um, providers and others were um, general practice and then had some adolescent patients. So over the course of the study, they had over 1,200 adolescents attend well child visits and physicals um, and they conducted depressive symptom screening at 95 percent of those uh, visits. Um, and then we saw Wobot referrals that we, were documented at 45 visits. So that's 4% of that total. And then looking at, um, you know, when they, when they offered Wobot, we saw that in 41% of the adolescents whose screening was mild to moderate depression were offered Wobot, along with 44% of adolescents who had moderate to um, moderately severe to severe depression. And they also um, made referrals, you know, in cases where there were no or minimal depression symptoms detected um, or there wasn't, we couldn't really determine depression severity. But I think the big picture, you know, the adolescents um, that were offered these 45, 45 of them, um, about half of them initially said, okay, yeah, we'd like, um, accept the referral, but then the next step of getting them to actually um, uptake was a, more of a challenge. So we saw only 15% completed this additional step to get a, a download code. And um, we have some data on Wobot downloads, but um, it looked like it was only around four people who downloaded the tool. So, but I think the other side of the piece is the clinician perspectives. And, and I think in general, um, they liked this option. You know, this was something new and they saw it as adding value. Um, some of the other feedback they had was this eligibility criteria we had that was based on depressive symptom screening results felt too restrictive. They really wanted to be able to offer this tool more broadly and other settings and not be bound by the screening score. Um, and then they also commented about motivation and interest. Um, you know, not teens sometimes um, not seeing the need for an app like this, not believing it could benefit them. Um, and and in terms of their recommendations, they they suggested you know putting more attention on can we get the youth to download the app at the visit, um, and also. Um, possibly involving a parent or guardian uh, was a, another idea that was proposed to help um, a young person in downloading and using the tool and, and just kind of uh, showcasing the tool more during the appointment, maybe discussing the benefits, the importance of downloading it. So in summary, um, I'll, we did find it was feasible for pediatric clinicians to offer a digital self-care tool um, to adolescents in the context of their, their routine care. Um, but there were some challenges that not all eligible youth were offered the app and the uptake, uptake was low. So I think the big picture is that additional strategies are, are really needed to support youth uptake and reduce some of the remaining clinician barriers to offering referrals.
So thank you. We have a little bit of time for questions. If anyone would like to ask in the chat or come off mute. I thought it was a super interesting presentation. Thank you for doing that work. What do you think that might look like in a clinical context, like downloading it? What do you think would happen with the physician in the room, with um, some sort of support personnel, somebody from you know the actual app that knows how to use it and how to download it? What do you think it could look like in practice? Yeah, um, well, sometimes they um, have a nurse on staff or maybe even a front desk, you know, could they be in a different section? I don't think the physicians are just too um, overwhelmed. So I, I think it would be have to involve another role on the team, but there may be other people we could tap into. I did ask like, is there a possibility of like a digital navigator and people just laughed, you know, we're so uh, stretched for money and staffing that, you know, there's not a lot of roles or, or things like that. Um, but I think, Maybe, you know, hearing the talk this morning, I was wondering, could you have somebody even do outreach? I think you don't want to lose them. You want them to try and do it while they're there. So whatever you can do to make it happen, um, that would be good. Thank you for the question. Um, with that, unfortunately, we are at time. I would really appreciate, can we have another round of applause for all the pre poster presenters today? Appreciate everyone being here and thank you so much.